Okay. So, um, in honor of the Scholar Strike um, initiative for September 8th and 9th, we're going to move our discussion of music, race, and the question of justice for our class uh, to a reading that is not on the syllabus, just to add to um, the material that we can uh, interrelate. So I'm going to read from Howard Thurman, The Search for Common Ground. This is from 1971-73, uh, page 100. And I'll read it to you. In many ways, the anti-Black hate mongers have become legitimized, and in many instances, but by no means in all, violence and brutality against Negroes have been given moral and social sanction. By vocal and most often silent consent, the cry for law and order is given a specific race, racially sinister meaning. The sanctity of sovereignty, as discussed earlier, expressed in the power of the state to exercise veto and certification over the lives of its citizens is declared to be in jeopardy. And order is separated from and given precedence over justice. The will to segregate that is inherent in the structure of American society is more and more stripped of its disguises and making itself felt without its customary facades. At the same time, all kinds of people in the larger society are being aroused to make their voices heard and their power felt on behalf of the creation of an American society inclusive of all. Such persons make the rejection of the more narrowly fixed and self-determined boundaries of the black community their strength and incentive. Up to and including the present time, no creative way has been found to accomplish the specific ends of identity and healthy self-estimate that is devoid of the negativisms that seem to be inherent in the present struggle. And then I'll, I'll just add a little bit more from the bottom of page 101, he says, Quote, there seems to be no recognition of the relentless logic tying present events and ideas with what has preceded them and from which they can never be separated, unquote. That's pages 100 and 101 of The Search for Common Ground by Howard Thurman. Um, any, any response to that? Would anyone like to respond to that? I mean, I think it's notable that you know, almost 50 years ago, he's talking about a situation that that could be, you know, probably equally relevant today, right? That's almost 50 years ago. So it's after the Voting Rights Act, but um, soon thereafter, right? 71, 73. Any, any thoughts about that? Yeah. I think that it's just, Like you said, it's notable that he's talking about um, things that are relevant today. And I just think that it's kind of mind blowing that it's still like all of these issues are still issues 50 years later. Right. Uh, it, it just, it blows my mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course it's hundreds of years. No, of course, yeah. Yes, yes. but in terms of the law and order capital, yeah. um, capital oh, you know, uh, initiatives of the government itself, um, and then all of the policies before that, too, uh, in segregation, um, Jim Crow, et cetera. Um, so law and order having, you know, as he says, a sort of sinister effect on the Black American community. He says uh, a specific racially sinister meaning, racially sinister, right? That this is really targeting in the way it's being practiced um, certain races over others. And so that there's um, the will to segregate and the lack of justice when this kind of initiative and this banner, you know, of law and order is flown um, the 
more racially sinister meaning may, may be overlooked, right? What are the consequences of this law and order initiative? Who is being incarcerated? How many years are they being incarcerated? What are their opportunities when they get out for jobs to vote, to, you know, to buy a house? What kind of consequences are being, um, you know, met against a certain community? Uh, other thoughts about that? The creation of an American society inclusive of all, inclusive of all with equal opportunity for all. Again, how can you investigate uh, this question of racial equity or racial inequity in our society to see if in fact everyone is getting the same opportunities or not? Um, and if not, how could that be addressed? How would you address that? Um, and if, to the extent that America is a land of immigrants, right? How have so many of the innovations and research, you know, growth and ideas been fostered by immigrants, you know, in the history of this country? And at what time, you know, are those um, people acknowledged or, or is that appreciation lost in terms of who's American and who is not American um, or to what degree, you know, are they seen to be worthy of all opportunities of American citizenship. So that's the Black American community and also um, other, you know, immigrant, uh, immigrants to this country, um, which uh, essentially uh, most people <laughs> if they trace their lineage back far enough, we'll have to acknowledge, you know, their immigrant status at some point in the long line of their lineage, uh, other than the Native Americans who are often not even part of that discussion, right? So how can we have a discussion of American society and not include the Native Americans who were here first? Um, so that obviously raises a big question for assumptions about who is American and white America versus uh, non-white America. Um, and, and those um, contemporary uh, political um, debates uh, that may be echoing, you know, decades of uh, debate political um, side, you know, uh, conflict in this country and the, the political policy making of this country. So Kendi's really urging us to look at the policies and to distinguish racist policies from anti-racist policies, policies that further racial inequity versus policies that further racial equity in our country and really break those down. Um, and then taking action, that an anti-racist would take action or at least you know, um, be able to express anti-racist ideas and speak that truth. Um, whereas a racist might not take action uh, or might take a more racist policy or racist idea um, into the arena of our society. So um, Howard Thurman is uh, a very strong voice of um, religious ideas, but common ground and humanity um, that is part of the Boston University um, society and um, our current uh, climate of the Howard Thurman Center is also something that's a resource for all of us in these discussions. And Ibram Kendi, who we are reading so much of in our class on music, race, and the question of justice, is also part of our Boston University community now. And we'll be able to engage with his ideas in uh, the book we're reading now, How to Be an Anti-Racist, 2019, but also stamped from the beginning, the history of racist ideas in the United States um, from 2016. So we'll continue to read. Yeah, please, Emma. Um, just while we're kind of on these topics, I read a really good um, article yesterday uh, that was, it's from 1964, but it was 
a reporter who was doing a profile on MLK for the uh, New Yorker and he happened to be on a plane with him and heard this kind of conversation between him and some random guy on the plane um, who was like pushing back on these ideas and I think it was really interesting the kind of justifications he was using for his racist ideas and really related to what we've been reading so I, if um, anyone's interested I'll just put the link in the chat if um, anyone oh, wants to look at the article. Yes, thank you very much. That's always welcome. And we'll listen to some musical examples on Thursday as well. Uh, I want to play for you, you may have heard before, Bruce Springsteen, uh, 41 Shots, that is about a case that is documented, I believe, in the ethnicity chapter. Uh, it's a very, very powerful song. And we also have some music of the sound liberation, uh, sort of, Christian choir that is um, also particular to Kendi's um, upbringing and his parents' experience. So we'll listen to some music and other examples that you can bring on Thursday. I'll stop this recording and we can, okay. So um, in terms of the American constitution, um, I wanted to offer some uh, relevant citations from Ibram Kendi's book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist from 2019. Uh, we're reading this in my other uh, class. And he, he gives a lot of autobiographical information and, and terminology of racism, anti-racism, and what those are in different concepts, uh, racial policies, um, ideas, racist ideas, anti-racist ideas racist policies, anti-racist policies, et cetera, and defines all of these different terms and themes. But he also brings in some research on specific statistics and um, you know, uh, different aspects of our own history in this country. So he cites um, US Supreme Court Justice John Harlan uh, all the way back from 1896 saying, our constitution is colorblind. Uh, so in his descent to Plessy versus Ferguson, the case that legalized Jim Crow segregation in 1896, he says that uh, court justice John Harlan proclaimed, quote, the white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country. I doubt not it will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage. So Kendi is drawing this out clearly to show that a colorblind quote unquote constitution in this case was really a constitution for a white supremacist America that the whites were dominant and would presumably continue to be dominant in this setting. As um, M.W. noted earlier, the white males, right, propertied white males were represented and they were meant to be represented and continue to be, they were expected and to be uh, in control of this political democracy and the voting and the, you know, uh, the ruling of it. So how the slaves fit into that or even freed slaves and then the Jim Crow, you know, segregation policies that often put those freed slaves basically back into a kind of indentured servitude to make money in plantations where they still needed the labor and still wanted to get that kind of free labor. Um, that there was a long struggle to really break out of that um, enslavement of the black Americans. Uh, in this country, and still you could say that we're still struggling with how to move out of a dual system or a multiple uh, system of criminal code that does not relate equally to all American citizens. So um, this is the kind of details when you dig into our constitution and you take you know, life, liberty, and justice for all, or the pursuit of happiness for all 
is that what we have had in this country? And was the founding of this country really meant to offer that? Or was there a double standard or were there different, you know, levels of expectation for different uh, people in this country? And, you know, what do you all think about that? I mean, we're talking about 1896, but we're coming up to, you know, we're now in uh, 2020 and we're still looking at um, cases of a double standard, right? Perhaps, you know, double standard in many facets of the society. Uh, we've been raising the gender issue in many of these documents that uh, really focus exclusively on men and all men are created equal, but what about um, people who are not free, right? And uh, what about different races, different ethnicities in this country? Uh, what is your thought about where we're at now, politically, socially? Yeah, anyone? Well, I guess I, I kind of don't understand how a person, I mean, like this, like just personally, I don't understand how a person can believe in the kind of like Freemasonry ideals that like all people like white men who are property deserve all this stuff, but other people don't. Like, I don't understand if you truly are like communing with mysticism and these kinds of things, how you get to draw those, how you decide you get to draw those lines and only certain people are allowed in. But once you're allowed in, then everything is fair and everything's great. So I guess I just don't understand how you can really feel like you're divinely communing or, you know, whatever terminology you're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just don't, I don't understand how like a person can come to terms with that in their own self. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And this, this is what came up uh, both in terms of slavery in this country and also in colonial uh, contexts, where colonial subjects might, if as they became educated, if they started to read the life, liberty, and justice documents of Europe and their European colonial masters, they started to say, wait a minute, we want that too, right, in Indonesia or India, right, as they became aware of these uh, democratic, you know, social democratic movements in Europe, and actually were able to read some of those documents, they, they wanted that kind of freedom and justice for themselves, right? So yeah, there is a contradiction that there's a, you know, a hypocritical aspect to um, some of these European philosophies of freedom and justice for all, uh, and yet they were like the most powerful colonial force, you know, all over the world dominating and controlling other cultures at the same time uh, enslaving you know africans in very in europe and in america so it is a contradiction it is you know a hypocritical uh value system if it's not applied equally to those that you are supposedly you know uh powerful over right to those to to whom you owe some form of um legislative respect, um, political justice. Right? Um, and we did see the sort of the falling apart of the colonial empires with the end of World War II, right? Where India became independent in 1947. Uh, Indonesia also became independent uh, right after World War II. And many other countries, because Europe had lost its moral force right where when the people realized what had happened in the the genocide that was occurring in europe in world war ii the the you know killing of millions of people and and the the scapegoating of the jewish race that 
Europe lost its moral uh, fiber, its ability to you know, hold itself as superior to all of their colonies and to the rest of the world. They lost that moral force. And therefore all of the colonies could say, you know, you don't have the right to control us. You know, you're not a superior race. You're not uh, a more morally superior to us. Out of curiosity, is that really, um, like how accurate is that a description of what a lot of these colonized countries believe? Like, did they really see Europe as having like a moral high ground to suppress and sometimes very violently overtake uh, these other parts of the world? Like that, that seems like a little bit of a stretch yes. to me. Well, you'd have to look at each case, right? And different colonial forces uh, acted differently, right? So the French in African countries uh, had a different way of, of controlling and administering their colonial practices than the British, right? And the French tended to want to make uh, certain Africans into African Frenchmen, <laughs> whereas the British were typically a little more detached that, you know, we're going to control your government and your economy, uh, but we're not going to try to make you British necessarily, even though if you, you are educated in a British, British system, of course, many uh, Ghanaians and others did go to England to study later on because they were raised in a, a British educational system and they spoke English, etc. So, so they manifest somewhat differently in each location and by different colonial forces. But I do know that there was a, a break in the, uh, the belief of the, for example, the Indonesian citizens when they were able to um, read the, the sort of liberty philosophies and, and uh, you know, revolutionary beliefs of the European uh, forces that they did recognize, you know, this is hypocritical. You know, how can you be controlling us and your own people are pushing for liberty and justice in France, right? Or in, uh, you know, Holland or Netherlands. So, uh, so there was a contradiction that the elite might recognize. Of course, the masses in each area were not reading, you know, these declarations of independence, but the elite might be right? The elite, the cultural elite from India certainly were like Gandhi and other intellectuals. Nehru, the cultural elite in Indonesia were highly educated and were able to read Dutch, right? So um, the elite intellectuals in Africa who could read English or French, right? They could dip into the, the European uh, documents and they could then start to relate it to themselves and say, wait a minute, we're the intellectuals for, you know, uh, this part of a pan-African movement or we're the intellectuals for the Indonesian independence or the uh, independence of India. And we see a contradiction here in these European writings as to how they're treating us and what they are espousing for their own people. So the elite were able to read the documents and actually challenge the truth value of that. Yeah. Um, so that's another, uh, it raises another aspect of this whole landscape, which is um, classism, right? Where you have elite educated intellectuals and scholars and sages, you know, who are, reading extensively and speaking for a larger community or for the masses, so to speak. And what is, what is that dynamic? You know, do we still have a lot of that too in this country where there's the educated elite who might go into politics or might go into, you know, um, debating politicians as opposed to everyone else who is, may feel that they don't have much say in the matter, that they are supposed to cast their vote one way or the other, but they're not part of the discussion uh, about how our government should be or how our democracy should, should run. And is that a part of the call for protest movements or social action uh, 
to involve a larger number of people in the political democracy and say, look, you can have a role in how you want this uh, political landscape to develop um, by participating in this social action, right? Through some kind of actual action, putting your body in this place at this time and making a statement physically that you're part of this movement. So there's the ideological movement and there's the action that might be required to demonstrate your allegiance to it, if you have an allegiance to it, right? Or that you don't have an allegiance to it. There are people involved on both sides of the spectrum who are putting their bodies in harm's way to make a physical statement about the political landscape they would like to see, right? So good question. Um, any other thoughts about the contemporary environment that we find ourselves in and how the ideals of this country and the constitution and you know, various political legislative you know, developments over time, whether those developments have actually furthered the ability to, to manifest equality and justice for all, liberty, life, and the pursuit of happiness for all? Or are we still a long way from actually being able to promise that? Anyone, just your own take on it. I, I personally would say we're clearly still in the midst of trying to reach for that ideal. I think that's demonstrated pretty well in the uh, social and political landscape. Mm -hmm. um, just, it's a very simple take. Yeah, yeah. Trying to get there. Trying, trying. But then there's always the question of, well, how hard are we trying? <laughs> you know, are we really trying to change, you know, the way things ha happen? Are we really trying to curb, you know, police violence against certain communities that leads to the death of individuals on a regular basis? Or are we really trying to understand both sides of, uh, you know, a dichotomy equally? Are we trying to change laws that are not working, like the criminal justice system? Are we trying to change certain practices through legislative developments? Um, and is it working? Is there uh, a political will to change? Someone's music is coming through. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> I'm just in the. I'm in the lobby of the. Oh, that's where you are. Okay. See because if I, I was just teaching. Yeah. So oh, okay. it's just a room that's open right there. Okay. But, um, what do I you, think, yeah, I think that kind of, there's like a dichotomy. So there's people who really believe that it's important to address the inequalities and look at them as inequalities and say, like these are the things we need to do and I mean that's why we have protesting that's why we have that's why we have kind of a dichotomous political system I think because I think on the other side of it there's this kind of like fundamentalist kind of like what was in that reading about like the difference between fundamentalism and believing you know like if you if you are true and you do all the right things and you believe in the right god and you act in the right way then you don't need to worry about the inequalities because they sh they shouldn't be affecting you because you're doing the things right. Mm. And so I, I mean, that's kind of how I, I think there just is like this dichotomy of viewpoint in the country. And that's why we're maybe not able to make the progress we want to be making because there's people on the other side that are, or, you know, one side or the other, there's just like such a difference of viewpoints that, it's really hard to like bridge the gap and make progress. I, I guess that's how I personally feel about it. Mm -hmm. You're right that it kind of goes back to the opening argument of the Timothy Canova in the article we read 
uh, the mystical roots of American political democracy, social justice and religious belief in a newer world, where he contrasts the sort of mystical um, principle of egalitarianism and uh, tolerance and social justice for all to what he calls a pernicious kind of fundamentalism, exclusivist, intolerant, and ego-driven, including the idol worship of the free market and a belief that your path is the one and only path to salvation. So market fundamentalism, greed, and, and materialism, and uh, belief that it's exclusive, right? You're on, you have, as you sort of mentioned there, April, uh, the right God, right? You have the right path or the right God, or you're doing the right thing. But the fundamental exclusivist um, ideology might think that others don't, right? So there's a dichotomy there. I have the right God, but you don't, right? So therefore we're different. I, I have, you know, um, certain uh, privileges uh, and that's okay, because I'm doing the right thing, and I have the right God, but you don't. You know, you're pagan, or you're different, or you have a different God, or you have different practices, and you don't deserve the privileges that I have, right? So there's a more of an exclusivist type of separation if what he's calling fundamentalist um, views might see it as there's the one right way, and then there's all those other people that don't actually deserve the privileges that I have because they're not part of this brotherhood. And it's interesting that, you know, even the Freemasons had a brotherhood, right? Um, and it was white property males, right? So, so even, even there in a more mystical, you know, supposedly, you know, egalitarian life liberty uh, approach and pr uh, principles to live by, uh, it was still white property males. Yeah. Um, anyone else want to comment? Yeah. This is, this is like a little bit of a pivot. So stop me if this starts making like not sense at all, but I'm just <laughs> pondering, you know, when, when the founding fathers, you know, like conceived of this, um, you know, like egalitarian ideal, like I'm starting to think of it like, could we interpret this more clearly as really moving just from uh, like, like I'll say like a meritocratic egalitarianism where it's like they've removed like the divine right element of like these people are preordained to have a good life. It's like we've taken that away, but then just reinserted you will do things or not do things um, that will earn you these rights or these privileges. So there's still like this very wide open door to be like, well, and these people aren't included in that because they haven't done what it takes or they've just, I, you could even like inherit, not divinely, but like inherit culturally, like the, these are just lesser people. like. Does that make sense what I'm asking? Like, is that, is that a, a, a valid interpretation of this sort of like twisted huh. ideal of egalitarianism? I think you're, what you're raising are some of the other themes that uh, Ibram Kendi does delineate in how to be an anti-racist, which is the issue of uh, racism. And there are different types of racism. So there's biological racism where people do associate it with um, a biological uh, racial distinction to say that these people are inferior because da 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 or these people are superior because of x y and z and you're associating that kind of biological racism with cultural racism maybe ethnicity or or race being the pr primary uh focus um and he is consistently pulling kendi is pulling the discussion away from biology, culture, or race to racial policy. So he wants people to um, recognize the, you know, the, the equality uh, of different races, that there's a 
by and large, there's, there's inequality in the racial, you know, spectrum, but that there are racial uh, policies and racist policies throughout, you know, the history of this country and other nations as well that have instigated racial disparities and racial inequities. And so he wants people to recognize the racist ideas that can be manifested in racist policies. And in order to really make an equal playing field for everyone, uh, not to blame them as, you know, well, you are, the people are to blame because of your, you do this, that, or the other, and to blame the people themselves, to take that blame off the people and focus with, you know, laser focus on the racist policies and the racist ideas behind them that have manifested over you know many decades in this country if not centuries and to attack the racist policies to create a more equal playing field so that's why he's defining racism and anti-racism so you can say well what would an anti-racist policy be what would an anti-racist policy look like and he's defining that as a policy that creates more racial equity, right? Less ra racial disparity and inequity and more racial equity. So if you have um, some form of discrimination, even like affirmative action, he's saying if it's creating more equity, then that is anti-racist. If you're saying we want to create more uh, racial equity, and that's why we're going to do this for a period of time or something. Um, hey, I'm like, so, but then that brings in the question of equity versus equality. I mean, obviously the end goal is equality, but that's not where we should be aiming right now. Equity needs to be the, the case, but does equity eventually lead to equality or are there other, other goals there that, you know, end up being served instead? Uh, can you explain what you mean? Yeah, I mean, there's the classic illustration I think a lot of people are really familiar with about the people at the baseball game, that equality is, they're all standing at a fence trying to watch the game. Equality is all of them have one crate to stand on, despite the fact that they're all different heights. So two people can see over, but the third is still can't. Equity is when the shortest person is given two crates, the tallest person is given none, and the person in the middle is given one. And there, all people can see over the fence and can see the game. So in this case where we're thinking about, you know, your example of affirmative action in order to reach out to minority groups or groups that are um, in situations that, you know, they might not be able to afford a school or there's other barriers to them for higher education. As that progresses and that becomes, you know, as affirmative action takes hold and more people are getting access to education, does it eventually reach a point where we have equality and affirmative action is no longer needed? Or is the issue of systemic racism so prevalent that equity is always going to trump the, you know, the idealism of equality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, uh, MW. Yeah, I, I was just going to build off that. I think that's a really good point. And it just makes me consider the like equity is something we can maybe achieve, you know, through policy, through legislation, but true equality, I think we can only achieve right through cultural shifts, right? By actually changing people's hearts and minds. And it's, it's almost like two completely different uh, mm -hmm. initiatives in that way, right? right? And that goes back to really where we started uh, in this class, which is the the inner mystical practice of opening your heart and mind to equality on a really deep level of awareness, personal awareness of equality and being able to really experience that perspective of, uh, you know, equanimity and equality for all. Um, and then the outer actions that might uh, be addressing inequities, racist ideas, racist, um, inequities in our system and trying to um, create more equity in our system while at the same time trying to understand to deeply embrace 
uh, an experience of equality in your own heart and mind. Those, there's the inner work and the outer work, right? Um, and I think we'll have to leave it there for today. So um, let us just um, stop this recording and we'll discuss the syllabus for a moment. Okay.